If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. Hello and welcome. If you're watching this video, then you probably have already started learning about data preparation and you may have some questions at this stage. For example, what are the right approaches to prepare the data? Is there a specific sequence in which we should follow these steps? Are there connections between these steps that we cannot shuffle their order? Now, if you have such questions, then let me tell you, this video is going to be your one-stop solution for all the queries related to data preparation. And if you watch this video till end, most likely you will never need another reference as far as data preparation is concerned. Why this is critical is because roughly about 80 to 85% of the time in a data science project is allocated towards data preparation. And if we go wrong with data preparation, no matter how good the models are that we are going to apply to the data to predict an outcome, the outcomes are going to be meaningless for us. So there is no coming back if you go wrong with your data preparation. That's why it's imperative that you understand these steps very well and understand them to the right depth. We'll divide this video into two parts. The first part is going to cover the common data preparation approaches, which are mostly taught and covered. The second part is going to be more practical. And the reason is that there are certain common pitfalls in the common approaches. We'll talk about those as well. Finally, we'll also give you a very good reference where you can actually learn all these techniques on your own, and that's readily available. So let's discuss the common approach to data preparation. You already see a kind of list here where you have missing value treatment, you have outlier treatment, feature scaling, multi-collinearity, and feature encoding. Let's discuss each of these and understand them a little better. So when you have data which is incomplete, you have some missing values in the data. The common approaches to missing value treatment suggest that if it's a numerical variable, you can go for a mean or you can go for a median. Now we've used some color coding here for a reason. If you're using mean, as a missing value treatment for a numerical feature, then you should ensure that you do not have extreme values in the data, which is actually the next step, the outlier treatment. So you need to be careful without checking the presence of outliers, you should not be treating missing values with the mean. Irrespective of whether you have or you do not have outliers in the data, you can always treat the missing values with the median. That's what the common approach suggests. But this approach again has some pitfalls and we'll talk about those as we progress. So once you're done with the missing value treatment, you can go to the next stage, which talks about the outlier treatment. Now, what are the outliers? Outliers are the extreme values in the data, which are very different from the normal values, and that's why you want to treat them. One common approach is to treat the outliers with the median, and the second approach is to perform winsorization, which is called a capping or flooring exercise. Essentially, if you have values above the upper limit in a box plot, you bring them to the upper limit, if you have values below the lower limit in a box plot, you bring them to the lower limit. These are two common approaches for outlier treatment, but we've marked both of them in red. Why? Because you do not want to treat your outliers unless you're sure that these are data entry errors. If your outliers are actual values in a data and they are meaningful values captured properly, you do not necessarily want to modify them, which is what mostly the common approaches follow and there is a flaw. The second flaw in both the missing value treatment and outlier treatment approaches that you've seen so far is that these approaches assume that each column exists independently. You do not worry about other features in the proximity of the feature that you're dealing with. You only look at that particular feature, look at its mean or median or the upper limit, lower limit and treat it. How this could be wrong, we'll talk about that soon. Next, we go to feature scaling. And you can see some connections here, some dotted lines here. You'll get to understand what's the meaning of these as we expand this further. So feature scaling, the common choices that are taught are standard scalar, essentially taking a data which is on different scales. So the columns of the data are varying in terms of magnitude. To bring them back to a fixed range, we apply these scaling techniques. Standard scalar is going to limit the data primarily to the range of negative three to three because it does a standard normal transformation and min-max scalar would limit the data between zero and one. So these are the common scaling techniques. Now, what is the relevance of this dotted line here that's coming here from outlier treatment? Let's understand that. A common mistake is that people do not check the presence of outliers or treat the outliers and they straight away go to scaling. Now, please understand, standard scalar uses mean and standard deviation for scaling. If you have outliers in your data, the mean and standard deviation both are already affected. So to use them further to scale the data would be a mistake. 
The tools would not stop you from doing that because they don't understand these technicalities. But we know this is not the right approach. When the data has outliers present, we should not be using mean anywhere for any interpretation. How can we scale the data using mean? Why standard deviation is a problem? Because standard deviations formula also uses mean. So there is a flaw in that approach. Second is min max scalar. So if you have outliers present in your data, your minimum or maximum values will be outliers. If you're using those values to scale the data, that again is a flawed approach. That's why there is a connection. If you're dealing with the missing values using a common approach, you can shuffle the position of outlier treatment and missing values. In this case, it would not matter. But we cannot shuffle the position of feature scaling and outlier treatment. Outlier treatment has to be done first before you do feature scaling. Talking about the common approach, the approach that most of us learn as the first approaches in any course. Next, it comes to multicollinearity. Now, why is this important? A lot of our algorithms have this assumption that the features or the independent features are independent of each other. They are not correlated. Now, the common approaches for multicollinearity treatment are that you can look at the features which are correlated and keep one of them and drop the other. So drop the correlated features is one treatment. The other is variance inflation factor. Again, we put a connection between outlier treatment and multicollinearity. Why? Because the formula for correlation or the Pearson's correlation, as we know, uses averages and standard deviations repeatedly. So if you have not treated the outliers and you're trying to interpret much out of multicollinearity, that in itself is a flaw. Plus, there are additional assumptions about multicollinearity. So as such, we should never do a correlation check without visually inspecting whether the variables are linearly associated or not. It's not the other way. We first need to check the linear relationship between the variables, and then we need to check for Pearson's correlation. So these are the common approaches for multicollinearity that we discussed. Now let's come to feature encoding. Most of the models would require the data to be numerical in nature. What if to begin with, you had some features which were categorical in nature? You could have features related to, let's say, the gender, let's say the ratings, which could be good, average, poor. You cannot pass this data as is to a model. You always have to do some kind of an encoding. And two common approaches that most of the people learn are label encoding and one-hot encoding. Now, this has been marked in red because there's a word of caution here. A lot of times there are solutions where we see people using label encoding for independent features. Please never do that. If you look at the scikit-learn's documentation for label encoding, it says it is meant for the target column. Label is another name for the target column or the dependent variable. So you should not apply it on the independent features. One-hot encoding is something that can be applied to a feature which does not contain an order. So what you see here are the common approaches and wherever we have put a connection, it simply means that this step needs to be performed first before you go to subsequent steps. Once again, note, there is no connection between feature scaling and multicollinearity. You can very well shuffle this. So even if you check multicollinearity first and then do the feature scaling, there is no problem. As such, if you study the properties of Pearson's correlations, it says that correlation coefficient is independent of origin and scale. So scale being there in place or not in place does not matter to collinearity. So this covers the common data preparation approach, which has its own challenges, and we discuss the right sequence and the common options.